Hey everyone, welcome back. Um, day two of our our little experiment and switching things up. Um, I did want to uh, clarify some things, a couple things I thought might be helpful. Um, Elise is asking if we turn reading comments in on Canvas now, right? And that's correct, yes. Uh, reading comments will be uploaded to Canvas from here on out, um, just like you do for journals. It'll be the same kind of format. You can put things into a text field or you can upload a document and that's how I'll, I'll get those from you. Um, if there's any other questions from people in the chat about just how things are going, uh, any difficulties you've run into, I'd love to hear about those and help you out on it. One thing I, I uh, can anticipate um, from talking with one other student from one of my other classes is they were saying that they, they were able to get connected, but it was a little harder because um, they only had, they, they got regular Skype. And um, I, as I said in the email, you got to get Skype for business, which is a different app. Um, and you want to log in with your BC login information, and that's how everything will move m much more smoothly in terms of connecting. So if any of you are watching this on YouTube later and have had trouble connecting, maybe that helps with some of that. Um, but in general, if you're running into any obstacles with how to get connected so you can attend the live lecture, I want to eliminate those obstacles because the more people we can get in live chat is going to be m better. Um, so uh, I, I want to open it up a little bit here. Um, to the chat to see if there's any questions left over from yesterday's lecture on Nozick. Um, I have some things from reading comments here that I, I, I've selected that I, I've got some got the papers right here um, that I can clarify some stuff, uh, questions that people have had. Um, but anything else, maybe chat while I'm going through some of these, think about them, plop them into the conversation. If you want to use the microphone again, just let me know and I'll make space here for you to I'll, I'll stop talking so you can talk um, and uh, let's let's kind of take stock of where we're at and then we've got uh, two big topics to cover today to finish up Nozick. One is to take a look at his argument, his main argument against the end state um, uh, principles of distributive justice. Um, this famous uh, argument, uh, the Wilt Chamberlain argument, very famous argument. Um, and then uh, we need to talk about uh, property rights <clears throat> under a broadly Lockean conception and how Nozick deals with something that Locke calls the proviso. The Lockean proviso is something else that um, we need to talk about. And we'll get into some interesting territory, at least dipping our toes in it. Um, things that definitely have opportunity for much further discussion. Um, some stuff related to um, intellectual property rights in particular and how our modern world is different than um, the world that maybe Locke was thinking about when he was putting his theory together and how we're gonna have to update it <clears throat> maybe what what parts of Locke's account make sense and which parts don't it's worth acknowledging that Nozick is a late 20th century writer so he's kind of contemporary he's not um, living in a in a drastically different world than we live in there's definitely some differences between now and the 80s um, and famously, although I don't want to spoil too much by saying this, Nozick, at the very end of his life, <clears throat> he sort of was like, yeah, I don't think my theory's correct. <laughs> um, and I really wish he had written more about this because we only get it from these like snippets of little philosophical remarks, like almost like journal entries that you write for me. Um, from Nozick, uh, there, and it's very hard to get a hold of these. I haven't been able to track down the primary sources. I only know about them through secondary sources reporting on them. Um, but he, he wrote a bunch of little essays on philosophy, and there's one in particular where he sort of thinks that as the world has changed from the 80s, he is no longer confident about how um, a, a capitalist system of private property ownership is able to protect democratic liberty to the extent that he used to think it could. Um, but, uh, you know, there's plenty of people who think Nozick is still right, his old version is right, and that his late in life sort of change is not um, maybe justified. But that's an interesting little nugget on Nozick. He's contemporary and he's sensitive to contemporary circumstances. Um, Mark uh, says, Nozick writes about time limits on patents as a rough rule of thumb for independent discovery. What does he think about other types of intellectual property, such as copyrights or trade secrets? Yes, we are going to talk about that. Um, really, there's no difference between these. I mean, the idea of a patent is the same 
part, it's related with intellectual property um, like copyright um, or trade secrets. And I think before I can address that question, we need to think about what are the principles that Nozick has in mind to figure out how to relate to that. This is very similar to something I've been talking about with many students about their paper projects. Um, and I think I've even mentioned in class at least once before that when we're thinking about like what should the what should the policy be? You know, what should intellectual property law look like? Um, patent law. What should? How should that operate? That depends on what what are sort of the moral considerations we're trying to design a system to be able to um, respect. Okay. So once we get that stuff down, then we can we can see how Nozick's going to deal with some situations, a couple in somewhat counterintuitive ways. So um, stay tuned for that. It'll be fun. Um, okay, so while other people are maybe putting some things into the chat, because I know it takes time to type sometimes, I'm going to use our time productively by addressing some of the stuff I saw in these reading comments. How, so here's a question. How can a government or a court of law define if the transfer of a holding is voluntary or not? Which is important, because this is the only moral measuring stick that knows it gives us for just transfer. Um, like we said yesterday, um, someone is entitled to a holding if it, under principles and transfer if they are freely given and freely accepted so this idea of consent is super important um, if someone chooses to do something of their own voluntary choice um, they have property to something and then they transfer it over to somebody else the status of that property to somebody else then that would be a, a just transfer how do you tell now that's a little trickier <clears throat> again we want to have a policy that reflects the moral reality. So what Nozick is identifying is that the moral reality that's significant or salient here is the notion of consent, of letting people have freedom and liberty with regard to their possessions. Um, how do you tell what counts as consensual, though, is a theme we're going to return to when we do this uh, neo-Marxist next week, um, who's going to be problematizing this and saying that um, whether consent is given is not just about whether someone says yes, um, but what are the circumstances surrounding their saying of yes and how this could factor into things like extortion. Um, so there are some philosophical and theoretical questions about defining consent. Um, this is probably very uh, familiar if you've thought at all about um, consent law when it comes to things like sexual assault. Um, there's been a lot of thinking about how exactly should the parameters of consent be defined. And that's true for this economic context as well, since Nozick is appealing to this as the moral phenomenon that's relevant. Um, in terms of how the laws could be designed, the policies to reflect that, well, we've got a lot of options here. Um, and even existing law is um, respectful of some of the subtleties or complications that can emerge here, like consent that happens under a context of fraud. Um, and there, there is the ability to make a legal case for fraud. Um, we don't always know directly, um, but we can have evidence <clears throat> that suggests this, and that can be considered in a court of law. So um, having perfect knowledge about the moral realities is always a problem. Uh, whenever there is an accusation of a crime um, or some wrong that's been done by one person to another, we don't always have the advantage of 100% empirical accuracy in terms of understanding the facts of the case to then be able to compare against the law. Um, <clears throat> anyone who has, I think, spent any time of dabbling around with the legal world knows that when you're making a case, there are two, two sort of main elements to it. There is the facts of the case, and then there's what the law says about it. And arguments can be offered on both fronts, so disputing the facts of the situation or how the law applies to it. That's kind of similar to here, if we're thinking about um, a moral result, um, is we can have some con controversy around the philosophy of it. You know, what are the principles, the moral principles that are relevant here for evaluation, and also what are the circumstances of the case. And when it comes to any ambiguity around the facts, um, we have to kind of do the best that we can, and that's where due process is important and making sure we have uh, institutional safeguards in place for making sure fair cases get presented and considered fairly, all the usual stuff that you get out of the law here. Um, so <clears throat> there, there can be, I mean, it's really nice when there is something like a contract that's signed, but even with contracts, there's a, a sensitivity as far as 
the law is concerned, and probably rightfully so, with the ambiguities that can happen there. So I hope that kind of addresses that question a little bit. Um, Camille asks, is Nozick disagreeing with his old philosophy, kind of similar to early late Wittgenstein thing, where he refuted um, his early work in the latter half of his life? Oh, that came from Anthony via Camille. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I mean, philosophers do this all the time, where they adopt a position, defend it, and then change their mind about it, and then they argue for a different position. This is not a, a <clears throat> isolated, rare sort of case. This stuff happens all the time. Um, the, I mean, it's a little different from Wittgenstein because Wittgenstein is uh, considering theoretical things. You know, it's it's um, theoretical considerations that have that caused his change in mindset. Whereas Nozick is more thinking that some of the um, the values that he was he didn't like change his values. He changed what he thought would be the effect of them. Uh, in the world based on the circumstances of the world, uh, which is always something we need to do. Um, that's why political philosophy isn't the whole story here. It's just um, one piece of it to get straight on the fundamental values and principles that should inform our evaluation of the world. Um, when, like I've said many times before, if you want to say, you know, is this thing good or bad, or should we do this, or shouldn't we do this, the answer, it depends, is always a fair one, you could say it depends on the circumstances, but you've got to specify in what way it depends. And in that, you're going to be appealing to some kind of principle or rule for how to address this. Um, and that's the thing that political philosophy is focused on, those, those fundamental principles. Okay, um, another one here uh, for distributive justice. Um, the question is, is this example correct or on the right path? So fairness of how rewards and costs are shared in society big theme we'll be talking about with Rawls too. Um, example, when some workers work more hours but receive the same pay, group members may feel that distributive justice has not occurred. This sounds closer to a meritocratic kind of model, which Nozick is not down with. Um, he's, he's not for any patterned principles about just distributions. Um, the way Nozick would look at a scenario like this is he would say, uh, if the workers agreed to do it, then it's on them, <laughs> right? It, workers agree to do the work for this pay. Uh, the people who um, uh, offered the job um, for that money, they consented to that freely. Um, so you've got an agreement here, and then whatever happens, that's what happens, you know. And that's that. That would be a just transfer, right? The, doing the work for this pay. Um, that uh, as long as everyone is agreeing to it, Nozick doesn't want to step in with any other principles that are going to determine whether this was just or unjust. Um, and that's the, that's the kind of hard bullet to bite if, if you're um, sympathetic with this kind of Nozick perspective. This is, I, I guess I'm just saying, this is one of the more controversial aspects to what he's proposing. Um, but we're going to see today, in a little a couple minutes here, uh, how Nozick is going to try to shoulder the burden of proof for himself here. Here's another one. So, in a theory of justice, in which I'm accountable to the historical injustices in transfer, it would be wrong of me to, say, purchase an artifact that I know is gained through grave robbing. And in contrast, then, current time slice principles would say that so long as I do no injustice in the moment, that I have done no injustice. Let's take those in turn. So, yes, the first to the first question, yes. If you knew um, that uh, the artifact that you purchased was uh, gained through grave robbing or let's say uh, connected with um, uh, what was it like something like um, cultural theft you know or like imperialistic conquest or something like that then yeah you you would not have uh, a just entitlement to that holding according to Nozick's theory um, because the person who tried to transfer that entitlement of holding to you did not have it in the first place. They had an illegitimate holding. So that's why the example I was offering yesterday where if I steal something from you and then sell it on eBay, the person who buys it doesn't have rightful claim to it. And then in contrast, current time slice principles would say that so long as I do no injustice in the moment, then I have done no injustice. That's not usually how these time slice principles work. So this is more, um, just to clarify here, the kinds of opponents that um, Nozick is taking up, given his position, are more like people who are be concerned about like 
the wage inequality or or just the uh, income or not not just income inequality but the disparity of wealth just the holdings that people have that that's problematic in and of itself or that we should be using uh, utilitarian principles to decide who gets what or how high the tax rates should be or things like that and Nozick's opposed to all of that uh, he is not utilitarian but you're actually going to see some interesting appeals to utilitarianism that are going to sneak in here by the end of the story today if we get all the way through the proviso. Um, so that actually is kind of a question. Um, how much is Nozick appealing to consequentialist values as a justification for something here? And if he does open the door that way, uh, then is he maybe opening up the door, door to certain um, uh, objections that to his position on consequentialist grounds. Now you don't have to be a straight-up utilitarian to be concerned about consequences or harm and benefit and things like that, um, but there always is the question of, okay, are you being consistent in your theoretical story of what morally matters here? All right, and let's see, I might have one more here. Um, <clears throat> uh, whoever makes something is entitled to it, Nozick said this, is this just referring to physical property or to more the quick answer here is much, much, much more. Um, it can it include things like uh, intellectual property, etc. Okay, so those are some questions from the reading comments that I, I thought might be helpful to clarify really quickly. Um, anything else from chat that you want to ask from following up from yesterday's class? It did get pretty lecture heavy, and I'm anticipating something similar today and throughout the rest of the week, um, especially with the online format. Um, but I do want to kind of do his, everything I can to encourage participation from those of you who are present here live. Um, it really adds a lot to the class, I think. And it, I think we've seen that in the rest of the quarter that we've had so far. Uh, so I want to keep that up. Here's a message coming in. Not part of the lecture. Are the reading comments due online now? Oh, 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 I, oh, maybe I didn't change the due date for, um, for Rawls. Uh, you get Rawls in tomorrow, that's fine. Anything else anyone want to ask about? Did I answer your question, Nia? Cool, cool. Clark's got a message coming in here. So when it comes to the pattern systems of distribution, is Nozick saying that if we have a pattern system, that redistribution must occur? Is he arguing for socialist communist ideas of redistribution? So Nozick wants to argue against that. So the pattern systems of distribution that say each according to blank, right, from each according to blank, some, some sort of pattern that's beyond just the one that Nozick is offering about consent. He's like, whatever people choose to do, as long as that's happening in this historical way that is just, like just transfer, just acquisition, then we're good here. Um, the, the patterned systems that he, he's labeling as his opponents are, saying, are looking to other sorts of values for how things ought to happen. So imagine, just as an example here, um, a, a utilitarian type of approach. So whether people are given property over something, they're entitled to a holding, comes down to whether it serves the most good. That would be a kind of pattern that Nozick is against. And he thinks if that was what was going on, if we were like, 
the justice and what people are entitled to in their property, what is a morally appropriate holding of property, uh, that will require redistribution. Um, so he's, he's going to argue against that, and that's what the main argument we're about to talk about with Wilt Chamberlain concerns. Like that, he thinks is as a reductio ad absurdum, that if your theory requires this kind of constant redistribution, there's going to be a problem about that. So more on that in a second. Um, but the, the, the position you're describing, Clark, is actually what he's arguing against. Um, Sam asks, uh, would Nozick say there is anything that cannot be justly held because it's being held by one individual detracts from society or any other reason, or can all things that can be acquired justly be held justly? This is an interesting question, Sam, and we can't really answer it until, oh yeah, I'm thinking like a vaccine or a property that could be useful. This is exactly what Nozick is going to be talking about at the end of the reading when he's talking about the Lockean proviso. And he, but just as a little foreshadowing for this, um, Nozick is going to say that this uh, Lockean proviso about worsening the state of others is not going to include some things that, like you're talking about here. So something that um, they're, they're, we're leaving something on the field in terms of possible benefit, that's not sufficient to uh, restrict the entitlement to a holding. Okay, so uh, once something is acquired justly, um, so we got the justice and acquisition happening, how something goes from being unowned to being owned, and that's happening in a proper way, then the, then the rules of, of justice and transfer take over. So the person who has acquired that entitled holding now can transfer it to somebody else if they want to. Um, but that is their choice to make, and it cannot be forced, uh, they can't be forced into what they're supposed to do with what they have. That, that's the logic of it. Mark asks, would Nozick be against a universal policy that gives all citizens their basic necessities? Um, well, given that a universal policy here, you know, where those resources are going to come from. Those resources are going to come from taxation. And taxation is a system of redistribution of wealth, according to Nozick. That's how he's going to think about it. Um, is Nozick against all forms of taxation? Well, probably not. Um, he is probably going to make some exceptions for this. But the, the burden of proof for justifying those kinds of exceptions is very high for him because the more that you interfere with this, the more that you're interfering with people's personal liberties. Um, and that was the whole thing that we, you know, especially under a Lockean conception, we're trying to avoid, right? We do not want to have um, a situation in which people's um, property is capable of being taken away from them, whether that's by a, a thief or by the government itself. Um, we want to uh, expand people's personal liberties as much as possible. And what the government is supposed to do is deal with the people that violate that in others. Um, that's the kind of stuff about law and order related to property that Locke was talking about. And just, I want to underline something I mentioned before, just for extra emphasis, that um, the appeal to Locke that Nozick is making is one way to do it. And that really all of the authors we're about to look at, Rawls, this neo-Marxist Cohen, they're all very much connected with the liberal tradition embedded in philosophies like the, the ones that we get from Locke or from Mill. Um, they're putting their own twists onto it. Sorry for the beeping of this truck. Um, okay. Um, Schalke asks, what is Nozick's opinion about monopoly against about natural resources? Is he against that? He talks about this explicitly in the reading too, and we'll get to that. Um, so this stuff is going to all come under the proviso. Uh, so let's get to that as soon as we can. Um, so uh, good questions here. Uh, keep them in, on the radar. I'm going to try to keep them on the radar. When we get to the Lockean proviso, let's see if these questions get answered a little bit more. And if they don't, bring them up again, or you know, a ask other questions. Um, but you're, you're all anticipating stuff that is uh, going to directly be a part of that conversation. But before we get to the proviso, we want to understand not just what Nozick's position is, but why he thinks it's right. So what is the basis for him disagreeing with any of these uh, end state or time slice principles uh, or patterned uh, systems of distributive justice? Uh, another big picture idea I want to put in for framing here. Nozick, like Rawls, like pretty much every political philosopher who talks on this subject, um, thinks about property rights as not natural. 
that they aren't, uh, you might have um, a natural claim, say, to bodily autonomy, right? That, that seems to be true. But most of them, and Nozick's included in here, don't think of property rights as something that exists in a state of nature. Locke kind of seems to talk this way, um, but maybe this isn't the most intelligible option. Um, that a property right is something that happens in a society. Uh, it happens in civil society. So I was mentioning yesterday how a, a libertarian is not an anarchist. They want to have rule of law. They want to have a government that puts restrictions on people and through the threat of force is going to enact those. Oh, you can't hear me? Oh, what happened here? Okay, looks like my microphone got muted for a second. Where did you lose me? Uh, how far back? What was the last thing you heard me say? That's weird. My microphone just like bzzed out for a second. Um, audio's back. Yeah, where did where did you lose me? I was talking about this big idea about how property rights are not natural or inherent, that they are uh, not a part of the state of nature, but that they're a part of civil society. Do we get that part? Yeah, right there. Okay, okay. So, so Nozick, uh, I've said before that like libertarians are not anarchists, that they, um, they want to have rule of law. They want to have a government that's going to uphold and protect property rights. Otherwise, those property rights don't mean a whole heck of a lot. Um, there, there's got to be a, some kind of system of accountability to make sure those things are protected. Um, the way in which there are laws that threaten to punish people who violate uh, property rights is how those property rights are protected. So to talk about what is a just holding or what is someone entitled to, we have to talk about what are going to be the restrictions on everyone else's behavior. This is an idea I've talked about before, about how rights and obligations are two sides of the same coin. If you want to confer a right onto someone for something, then you're imposing obligations onto everybody else about their behavior with respect to that person. So having a right to my coffee cup means you're all under obligations to not interfere or attempt to have control over this in certain ways. Right? You can ask me, hey, can I borrow your coffee cup? And then I can be like, sure, here you go. And there, there's a just transfer, right? Uh, there's a just access to that property that's happened there. Um, but the parameters of this, um, what conditions under which I have rightful control over something or you have rightful control over something, depends on this, this set of rules. Um, so there isn't a, a, without a system of cooperation of society, you just don't have property rights. You have power, <laughs> like I might be holding the cup, now you have to use force to take it from me or something, and maybe the use of that force against me is morally problematic. Um, but the idea of a property right is sort of unique to um, social institutions, to civil society, and Nozick definitely thinks that that is true. He does not think of property rights as being extra legal, so to speak, or, or somehow inherent, um, or like a natural property or something like that. So the question of what are you entitled to has to be answered from the standpoint of what does a just society look like? What are the rules for how we're going to coordinate economically? And then you get to figure out what you are entitled to. So it's not based on what you currently have control over, but it's a matter of this cooperative system of society and how we want to set up those rules. So Nozick doesn't presume property rights. He argues for them as something that emerge at the end of this debate. So when we're trying to decide, what should we do about this? You know, How much taxation should occur? How much redistribution of wealth? Um, society gets to make some choices about this. Why wouldn't we choose in favor of something that does the most good for people? Like if there's that tiny, tiny slice of people at the top of society that own all the resources, and those resources aren't being put to good use, and you've got all these people at the bottom who are suffering, seems like there's a pretty straightforward utilitarian argument to say, yeah, we should take some of that money and give it to these people. Or, or and that maybe not in that blunt force way of doing it, but something in principle similar. Maybe through um, progressive tax, 
and setting up social programs to support people who are in more vulnerable economic situations. Something like that. Why wouldn't we want to do that? Nozick says, here's why. Uh, bottom line, if you have, uh, if you invoke a kind of patterned model here for distributive justice or what people are morally entitled to have ownership over, um, then you're going to have to interfere with people's liberty and their free choices on an ongoing basis. Um, there's no way to just do it once. So this, this is the point of the Will Chamberlain thought experiment, is that you can't just have your revolution, redistribute the wealth, and then justice will be served if you're defining justice in these patterned ways. He says, as, as soon as you let people go for any amount of time, you're going to get back into a situation of inequality or, or the pattern that you prefer, whatever it is, is going to get upset and we're going to require another intervention again. So the way um, Nozick, I'm not going to rehearse the whole Wilt Chamberlain thing because you've done the reading and I don't want to take a bunch of class time to do that, but just maybe as a couple callbacks here. You, the scenarios, we imagine, this is just a really blunt force toy example, but let's say this is all about um, wealth inequality. So the government redistributes all the wealth, so everyone has an equal amount. And then Wilt Chamberlain, amazing basketball player, one of the most gifted basketball players in all of history, says to his team, he's like, I'm not going to play for you unless every time you sell a ticket for the games, um, people, when they buy their ticket, they have to put 25 cents into a jar for me. Like, like an extra, uh, it wouldn't really be a tax because this isn't by the government or anything, but Will Chamberlain's just saying, here are my conditions. Um, and the team is like, well... You're such a good basketball player, and you're a major attraction for why people want to buy tickets that, yeah, sure, we agree to this too. Okay? We're the ones that own the stadium, we own the team, we're, gonna, we're the ones in control of that, so we're going to use our property in this way, and Will Chamberlain's like, yeah, this is, I, I have a right to my body, I don't have to play basketball for, for society, you know, for <laughs> utilitarian purposes or something, I can choose to do this. And he's like, here are my conditions. And everyone agrees. And then the people who are buying the tickets, they're like, oh, man, I have to pay an extra 25 cents for Wilt Chamberlain. Well, sure, yeah, that's worth it to me. And so they do this. Let this go for a little while, and now suddenly Wilt Chamberlain has, like, a ton more money than everyone else. Was well, that unjust? Now we've got wealth inequality again. If, you're, if you have this pattern principle, then you're going to have to go in and do another revolution to, like, even up the playing field again. Um, from the way that it's been destabilized through the result of people's choices about what they're going to do with what they have. Um, and then after you do that, it's going to get imbalanced again, and so you're going to have to have this continual um, intervention. And if that doesn't automatically seem like it's problematic, if that doesn't already do the trick for you, think uh, Nozick might encourage you to think about it this way. If you know that there are going to be these periodic redistribution things that are going to happen by the government, then that's really going to change the way that you make your contracts. Um, people aren't going to agree to do things with each other in the same sort of ways because they know it doesn't really mean anything. Like, I might, uh, I'm not going to sell a bunch of stuff that I have if I know that in a little while the money I made from that sale is just going to be taken away from me anyway. Right? This is going to really inhibit what I'm able to do with what I have been justly given. So even, even under a um, redistribution of wealth kind of model, one of these like uh, patterned models of justice and holdings, um, there's still the idea that you want to have some property rights. Like you, you want to be given something and if you're like, okay, I, I don't have an unjust holding because it's equal with everyone, what everyone else has, now I get to do what I want with what I have, right? And then the answer is, well, for now, until the next time we have to do a redistribution, right? So it sort of upsets that uh, option for liberty. So Nozick is saying, if you go down this route, then you're signing up for constant interference by the government in people's personal choices. Um, would the government say, you can't make choices that are going to result in a disparity of wealth? Okay, so now you got you don't have any of those choices anymore. This, this is how it's supposed to work. Chat, how's this making sense to you?
the Will Chamberlain argument making sense of uh, as a demonstration of what Nozick is concerned about with these patterned models of just holdings? Making sense for you, Clark? Cool. I got some people typing. Good to hear. Cool. Making sense. All right. All right. Uh, if you got questions, I'm going to move on here, but don't be shy about going back. I know it's a little awkward here on the chat because it takes time to type in something that you're wanting to ask or say. Um, I'm cool with jumping around just to deal with that because I, I want more input. I know it can really feel like, oh, you're moving along and now we're on to something else and and um, not slipping it in. But um, I'm trying to balance here as much interaction as we could possibly get with the like using our time efficiently where I'm not just like sitting here and like, waiting or waiting for minutes or something um, so don't be just in general for people with this live online format don't be shy about like doing a call back to something that we've kind of moved off from it's like 10 minutes in the past or something that's okay I, I think we should we should go we should choose to go with that kind of uh, framework okay so much for um, these justice and holdings from a really big picture perspective um, and we've talked a little bit about what justice and transfer is going to look like, and consent is the core thing. And so there's some symmetry here about Nozick's argumentative line. His main moral concern is about preserving choice, by pre preserving liberty for people to do what they want with what they have. That is the that is the big thing. When someone uh, when there's an unjust transfer, when it's not consensual, then that principle is being violated. Right? If you steal from me, I didn't agree to that. There's no consent there. And my liberty to do what I want with what I, what society says I justly have a right to, um, that, that civil notion of a property right, uh, when someone steals from me, then my liberty with respect to that thing has been compromised. And that's why those kinds of justices in transfer are unjust. Uh-oh. Okay, I hope that that garbage truck does not go into my apartment. Uh, yes, it is. Okay. <laughs> All right, we've got a garbage truck coming in. Are you able to hear it, everyone? Is it coming through the microphone? Yeah. Oh, boy. Well, this won't be a... This won't be a daily occurrence. Um... I don't know, does this help at all if I do this with the microphone? It does help. Okay. Alright. <laughs> okay. Alright. Let's go for this. Alright. So, um, the Lockean Proviso is all about justice and acquisition. So there's a question. We, okay, we got a handle here on justice and transfer. Um, well, where do people get their property rights in the first place? Um, where, where do things go from, how, how do things rightly and justly go from being unowned to being owned? And Locke is really concerned about this. He's got a scenario that he is worried about. But before we set up that scenario, let's just talk about the general logic here. Um, knows it goes through some some kind of obviously bad answers to something like this. Um, you know, Locke has a general intuition that by mixing your labor with something, you that's the basis on which you can lay claim to a, a right of acquisition. So when you mix your labor to it, um, you change something. There's something that is like naturally available, like a natural resource um, that everyone just has free right to. It's kind of like public property, right? But um, Anyone can go and use this thing. Um, but once someone has uh, ownership over it, then the situation is different, right? Um, and what would cause us to say, you know, it's right in society for us to allow this person to have um, a kind of rightful control over the thing that before didn't happen? Okay, so um, again, keep in mind one of the, the framing principles I talked about earlier in this lecture, that this isn't a natural right, this is a social decision. You know, it's part of how we're going to organize with each other in um, this system of cooperation that is society. Why would society want to give an individual an entitlement to something that before anyone could have? 
And the idea is, that comes from this mixing of labor really comes with an eye to the rest of society, of like what society's like skin in the game here for, for allowing this to happen. Because it is going to be an infringing on liberty for others. Um, that's going to happen. So I, I like this scenario of imagine we all live, all of you here, you know, you and me, we're all in a big anarcho commune or something together. We're, or we're just, it's like pre society. Um, something like, um, sorry, this is almost done. We don't, we don't really have too much of a government or system of social organization very much going on. Um, we just kind of, we're maybe like hunter-gatherers or something, and we just are hanging out in a certain place. Um, and we've got our little village or something. And there's a bunch of fruit trees nearby. And so people can just, just go and get fruit whenever they're hungry. Um, all right. Sorry about that weird interlude with the, the garbage truck. Okay. I'm going to put my microphone back there now. Okay, so um, there are these fruit trees nearby, and people just go and pick them and eat them whenever they want to, because no one owns it. You know, no one can say, you can't eat this fruit because it's mine. You know, there's nothing like that. Um, a lot of toddler scenarios I deal with now are <laughs> sort of similar to this, like a public play space or something. No one, you know, I'm, no one has a basis for denying someone else access on something or that there's any restrictions on this. But then what if we wanted to say, well, this person is, you know, someone's mixing their labor with it, with some of the trees, like maybe one tree. Um, I'm, I, I decide to invest my time and energy in nurturing that tree, and I'm able to make it so that the tree bears more delicious fruit, something like that. Right? or more nutritious, or just better than the natural fruit trees that are growing, okay? So Locke says, um, it isn't that I, the logic here of why that might be a basis for me to lay claim to this thing doesn't come from how I've taken something that is mine, like my own body, my own energy and effort and work, um, and mixed it with something that I don't have. Um, I love his, uh, ex his counterexample of taking a can of Campbell's soup that you own and pouring it into the ocean and then laying claim to the ocean. Like, that doesn't make sense. Um, that, that can't be what's going on here. It's rather that um, m me giving, get, getting ownership over something is sort of like a encouragement or a respect for what I have invested into making that thing better. Okay, so if I know that I'm going to be able to get control over this thing by mixing my labor with it, then, um, then I will be maybe more encouraged to do that. And there's benefit for everyone else in our little community when I do this. Even if they no longer have, all the rest of you don't have access to that fruit tree uh, that I have been tending because now I've got the property rights to it. Okay? What is the advantage? Well, consistent with the things that Locke is concerned about, you've got more liberty. You've got more choices. Because you can still go and pick from the other fruit trees if you want to, or you can trade with me or make some kind of arrangement with me to get access to this better fruit. Right, so now your choices are increased. Before, you only had one option to pick from the fruit trees and take them as is. Now you've got more options. Now you've got more freedoms. Um, and this can be extrapolated to uh, much more complex scenarios like our modern world, where you've got a lot more choices um, that people are trying to innovate and do different things to create different goods and services, and you've got this marketplace, right, of where you have lots of choices. Now there's also a lot of restrictions too. We're going to talk about the restrictions that come with private property too as we keep going with this uh, conversation over the next week and a half. But um, that is, that's kind of the core logic to it. Now we get into a little dilemma here though. Um, this, is, this is why Locke puts the proviso onto it. So there's a lot of scenarios in which if I mix my labor with something and then get the property rights, everyone else is put into a worse off position. Like, let's say I mix my labor with all of the fruit trees, and now I own all of them. Well, that sucks for all the rest of you in, in our little community. Now you don't have access to a food source. <laughs> you know, I have a monopoly on it, and that's a problem. 
Locke is worried about monopolies. I know that's something people were, were curious about earlier. Locke is really worried about the negative social effects to having property rights running rampant with no restrictions on them whatsoever. So while there's a certain um, basic uh, intuition, moral intuition about how if I make it, it's mine kind of thing, like if I take a stick and turn it into a flute, that's mine now, right? That's my... Um, it's my stick, stick flute, <laughs> and I can do what I want with it. But if we take this to the extreme, then there can be a bunch of social costs that we don't want to have to pay. Okay, so that's a that, that's what creates the demand for some rider, some caveat, some extra condition that restricts the general logic of you mix your labor with it. That's how you attain a, a legitimate claim of ownership over the thing that before was not owned by anybody. Okay. So what's the what's the the proviso say? Locke says you mix your labor with it, you gain ownership, provided that you given being given ownership of it doesn't put everyone else into a worse off position. So in the idea that you still have access to the rest of the fruit trees, um, you're in a better position. The rest of you, even though you don't have access to that one tree that before you did, um, you're in a better position because you have more choices and you have more potential benefit to be had. But here's where a little dilemma shows up, a little paradox. So um, let's say I do that with one fruit tree, and then you're like, oh, hey, I want to do that too. So you start mixing your labor with another fruit tree that's in the orchard. And so now you lay claim to it. And that's still a benefit to everybody else in society because now there's competition between you tending your fruit tree and me tending my fruit tree. And maybe the fact that people now have the option to go either one if they want the nicer fruits, um, you know, that's going to encourage us to make even better results possible or options available to everyone else in our community. Okay? Is this logic making sense so far? Yeah, cool. Thanks for the little check-in here. Awesome. Appreciate people saying so, whether it's yes or no. Okay. So this keeps happening. And then there's one fruit tree left. And then a person is like, I don't know, one of the rest of, some of the rest of you in our little community here we're imagining, someone's like, I'm going to work on that one. Oh, wait, I can't. Why? Well, because if you were to mix your labor with it and then take ownership of it, now everyone else is in a worse off position because now they don't have access to the free fruit, right? Now they're going to have to contract with somebody to get a hold of their fruit. So that puts them in a worse off position. So that means that person can't lay claim to that. But if they can't, here's the paradox that emerges. The second to the last person can't do that either because if they took their ownership of it, then that would mean someone else doesn't have the option of being able to lay claim to the last one. And if they can't do it, then the third to the last person can't do it, and then the fourth to the last person, and then going all the way back to the original one. So the concern here is that Locke's proviso might logically entail a scenario that no one is ever able to take ownership of anything through justice and acquisition. That's the paradox. And Nozick has some answers for how to deal with that, um, especially that are relevant to the modern world, in which very little of... of the world is unowned. Everything's owned by someone. Is this a disaster for the Lockean proviso? And Nozick wants to say no. Um, that this proviso, in talking about the worsening of the situation of others, needs to be understood in a more nuanced way that doesn't, um, that doesn't ignore how there can be great benefit even if there's no longer any free resources that people are able to to take without having to work with the contracted aid of others. Okay, um, that that and that's where we'll pick it up tomorrow because I am out of time now. <laughs> I got to get ready for my next class, um, so I have to officially say goodbye to everybody um, for right now. Oh, code word, yes, Niha, thank you so much. Um, let's do orchard. Orchard is the code word for today. Yeah. I was so excited to get through as much of this proviso stuff as I could. I was not thinking about it. Orchard is the code word. Orchard. Uh, <laughs> O-R-C-H-A-R-D. Pretty sure. Orchard. If you say fruit tree, I'll take it. <laughs>
I'm not the best speller. I hope I did that. Should have been garbage truck. Oh, yeah. Oh, man. Garbage truck. That would have been good. We could do garbage truck. Orchard. Fruit tree. Garbage truck. I'll take any of them. <laughs> All right. Um, we'll pick this up more tomorrow. I do want to get into rolls tomorrow, um, but there, there's some, there's still some cool hanging threads here from um, Nozick that I don't want to let pass us by. Um, yep. Have a good day. Hey, Sebastian, you're in, uh, you're in my other class. <laughs> bye, bye, everyone. See you tomorrow.